instead of trying to do all this live, we're going to talk about cleaning and collimation uh, in this video, which I'm making making for the club. We'll talk about when, when to clean, uh, what not to use, uh, cleaning kits, uh, which I have set up right here. I'll be talking about that shortly. Uh, we're going to take out the mirror on a six inch daub as a uh, side digression. We're going to uh, clean the uh, corrector plate on an SCT. Going to reinstall everything back into the daub, collimate it, and go from there. All right, before we get going, let's talk about a cleaning kit. I recommend you put one together. Um, cotton balls are dirt cheap. I really, really like these cotton rounds that you can get. Uh, obviously, you can see I get them from HEB. Um, squirt bottles, you can be had anywhere. I have one here with DI water. I have another one here with one part isopropanol, two parts water. Um, got 70% 70 isopropanol here. And you can buy Kim wipes at uh, specialty stores. You can also get uh, lint lint free towels. Also, I recommend you get a squirt bottle with um, have it with DI water in it. The only thing I don't have in this would be a gallon of DI water and uh, Dawn soap. Um, I do recommend 70% um, and cut it cut it in half. Now on the net you can find recipes all over the place for how much to use. Um, I'm using basically a one part isopropanol to four parts water. You can use one to one. Um, as I said the recipes vary all over. You just need some alcohol in there to help get some of the get any of the organics off and to help get the rest of the water off. Now let's talk about a controversial topic. I have seen people talk about using canned air. Uh, absolutely do not shake it if you want to try to use it. Um, you want to put the trigger very gently. Don't for pull the trigger very hard. You will get the propellant coming up here and then out and you will shoot propellant onto whatever. Truthfully, um, you could use it to you know, blow off the big parts of things that might, you might have on a corrector plate or, or even a mirror. I tend to stay clear of them to be honest with you. So I have this cleaning kit put together, ready to go, and it uh, I'll use it whenever I need it. Alright, what we're going to do here <clears throat> is we're going to take out the secondary. I'm going to go in with a gloved hand and a Phillips screwdriver and even try not to touch the mirror with the gloved hand and pull out that center screw. And there we go, single point, single connection with the three screws. While it's not necessary, I do recommend either with a label maker or a Sharpie and tape, mark your uh, uh, mirror and the tube so the mirror comes out and goes back in exactly the same way. As I said, not 100% necessary, but it might, it might help with uh, not having to do so much collimation in the end. So here I'm pulling the screws, rotating the scope ever so slightly. Getting them out. I need to pull off the bottom gasket, otherwise I'll, I'll never get the primary out unless that gasket's removed. I'm going to flip it over so I can get to that last screw. some room, reach in, and slide it out. 
and there we have it. And you can actually see the centering ring has slipped, so I need to put a new one on. And definitely, definitely in need of cleaning. It'll look a lot better in a few minutes. Here I've got it in the sink. No, I'm not even going to take it out of the uh, mirror. So I'm going to go straight on in, start adding some water, start getting some of that dust to uh, get that dust and stuff wet so that it'll soak. And I'll leave it for leave it for a couple of minutes. Like anything else, like doing dishes, it'll come off a lot better when wet. Okay, here we're getting ready to turn on the water. <clears throat> Start trying to get some of this stuff off. Change over to a spray. Pick up a few uh, cotton balls and start gently taking some of that stuff off. I'll use a cotton ball single purpose. If it gets totally saturated, I'll toss it. Otherwise, I might flip it over and use the back side. And here again, I emphasize we're not doing anything more than just the weight of the wet cotton ball across the top. I'm not using a lot of force here. And yes, you do have the protection of that silicon dioxide layer, but you don't want to push your luck. A little more water. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to wet the back of my uh, right two right two knuckles. I'm going to gingerly go over the surface. Again, I am not bearing down at hardly at all. Also, feel for anything that might still be attached to the mirror, and I found absolutely nothing. So. The entire surface was nice and uh, nice and smooth. Tip it up to do a little bit of draining. Looking okay. Any of those streaks you see in there, when we get to the 70% or the uh, isopropanol stakes, I will take care of those. But it's looking 100% better than what it was when I started. Again, the cotton balls. If you get the idea, there's a lot of wiping involved. That's the gist of it. Yeah, probably could have dumped it a little bit. But <laughs> you know you're going to make a mistake somewhere along the line for actually trying to put it onto film. Now come in with 70%. Oh, I'm sorry, this is distilled water. We need to get rid of the uh, tap water. So we'll just do a little spritz layer. I'm wiping that off. And while we're kind of letting that air dry, we're going to pull out the secondary. I'm going to give that a little spritz of uh, the eye. So the private se secondary mirror hangs upside down. There's not a lot of opportunities for it to get dirty. So I almost, almost didn't need to clean this. But since I was doing one, I may as well do the other. And uh, since I'm showing how to put the secondary back in, I decided to take it out. So I'm just giving a couple wipes. And there we go. All right, with the secondary done, we're going to come back and we're going <clears> to <throat> get the water off with uh, the isopropanol. 
on the uh, on the primary here. Spritz that up, and then it's going to be the same story you've seen before. Wipe, wipe, and wipe. If it wasn't such a small mirror and it didn't go so quick, I would almost investigate speeding this part up, but still you get the idea. This isn't rocket science keeping these mirrors clean. Just a little common sense and some common reagents. And we're wiping, and we're wiping. And it's starting to look pretty good. Clean up a few little streaks. Looking it all over, not finding much. I think we're good. As you can see, we use just a little bit of cotton to clean this up. Now while you're at it, and you click a click and the mirrors are drying, go in and take care of your hardware that's inside the tube. Okay, we're going to do a very quick uh, digression here on using that very same cleaning kit to uh, clean an SCT uh, corrector plate. Uh, before an imaging session, um, I'll check over uh, the corrector plate, and if I catch more than just a little bit of dust on it, I'll, uh, I'll clean it. I've removed corrector plates, cleaned both sides, cleaned secondaries, and uh, collimated SCT so far. So far, I've yet to uh, have to clean the primary of an SCT. But if you do, I can recommend this uh, YouTube video. The interesting gentleman here, uh, uses what uses a dabbing method to soak and clean his mirror and by the uh, internet has, has nicknamed him the dab dab man so that's why I've included that I originally was going to do this as a vid but somehow I gacked up the recording and a two and a half minute cleaning vid got slowed down so far that in normal play it became a 16 minute uh, vid so there's no way I was going to do show 16 minutes especially at slow motion so I'm going to do this kind of slide by slide. Here's the, uh, here's the SCT I'm doing. Uh, I'm doing it on this mount. I'm doing it horizontal. I could do it vertical. Uh, you have to watch, as you'll see, when you spray on here, you have to watch for drips and runs. Uh, but you also have to run, watch for puddles if you have it standing up. So it really doesn't make any difference. I'm so used to cleaning these uh, SCTs in a horizontal plane. That's how I do it. So I first come in and spritz in a little, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, distilled water. Let it on there. Let it soak for a little bit. I want to watch and make sure you're not going to get any uh, streaks and runs up here or down here on the retaining ring. Then once it's had a little few moments to sit, you come in, take we'll take one of those cotton swipes, and swipe your way. I'll fold it in half. Swipe it again. Uh, some might argue I ought to be wearing gloves. Again, that's entirely up to you. In fact, if you're your first few times, I would recommend you also have gloves on. But um, I do this so commonly now with my SCTs. Uh, I can do it without touching, without touching the uh, uh, corrector plate. So I wipe some more. Wipe some more. I'll show this. This is a little out of focus because the camera focused in on the uh, corrector plate that you can already see has is, is got a bit of improvement of being cleaned. I'll show this toward the end again. Wipe some more. Wipe more. 
And I'm changing this after I fold it over as I've done here. So in the process of doing this SCT, I will probably use uh, a dozen of these wipes. It's clean enough. Now I'm going to spritz on some of the uh, uh, 1-4 to isopropanol and go from there. I'll get it laid out as you can see here. But just like in a wine glass, you're going to start seeing it'll, it'll run a little bit. Uh, the isopropanol decreases the viscosity of the water and it will start to run. So you really want to make sure you don't get runs into the secondary and you don't get runs into your retaining ring. And it's basically the same procedure. We're wiping and we're wiping and we're wiping. <laughs> It'll look good. You can actually start seeing things. This might be a streak. No, that's actually my uh, window frame to one of my back windows. Uh, I come over here to this one. I'm going, oh my goodness, I have a dirty backyard. I need to clean it up. Because you can actually see a lot now in a clean mirror. Here, a clean reflector plate. And I think it's made a, a modest improvement. I think we're good to go. Here are the two cleaning ones that were done initially. And that's a short version on doing an SCT. All right, another cleaning uh, digression. This one is a larger mirror, much larger than the uh, a six inch. This is actually a 12 uh, inch, inch reflecting mirror. Um, the cleaning of the larger mirror is the same as cleaning the smaller one. You have to think more about the size and weight and be careful of that. Uh, make sure you don't get pinched and for heaven's sake, make sure you don't, don't, uh, don't drop it. I also had this set up originally as a vid, but when I put all the little small vids end to end, it ended up being 14 and a half minutes. And I felt that was a bit long for a, uh, a digression, so I'm going to proceed this way as, as well. All right, here's the mirror. It has a cover, and it's been stored outside. Uh, the cover also needs cleaning because these are actually mud dauber uh, nests at one time. Uh, here's the mirror. It's got these... Uh, hold down points that have cork underneath the tips as you can see here and here and this this one has one too and it's held in place with a screw that's that's somewhat out of focus here in the next slide it shows you the extent of the uh, uh, mirror and I'm really just cleaning the mirror for its own preservation right now this mirror does not have a home but you can see some of the little felt has come off and there are spots and it has been at least 10 to 12 years that we can estimate that this since this mirror has been cleaned so I'm going to pop it out carefully from the mount. There's the mount itself. I've placed the mirror, uh, placed the mirror into the sink. Um, this mirror is pretty much cast iron, and I'll move it out of the way. And I just turn on the water and run. Let it go for the better part of uh, three to four minutes. And then, as I did with the, uh, uh, wasn't shown very readily with a six inch mirror I have a uh, two cups of water here with about uh, two to three drops of Dawn dishwashing detergent and I'm dribbling that all over the mirror uh, here and I'm going to let it soak letting that soak for a few minutes then I'll come in wet the back of my fingers uh, with this with uh, uh, water and start gently going over the top of the mirror and getting a lot of the stuff off. I felt nothing that wanted to stick to the mirror. Everything everything fell off just fine. Uh, this mirror actually in the end cleaned up uh, nicely. So there's more rinsing, a little more rinsing. I tip it up to get the water off. And as you can see, we've made, a, made an improvement in the mirror in just that alone. I come in with some distilled water and try to start rinsing off the uh, tap water start wiping it down here with cotton balls. I must have gone through about 15 to 20 cotton balls just getting the, the bulk of the water off at this point. I could, you can also stand them up. Uh, don't leave them unattended, but you can also stand them up and let them drip dry as well. Want a little bit more, dry it off a little bit more. And then I came in with the uh, isopropanol and spritzed it up. <clears throat> Started carefully wiping it down. Going down a little bit further dry and checking for any streaks. As you can see, it's really, really cleaned up nicely. 
I did do something that I haven't done on many of my own mirrors is I came in with a flashlight <clears throat> on the back side and yeah you will these coatings are thin enough you will actually see some flashlights will, will uh, work their way through. Now don't take that as a bad sign this the reflective coating on this mirror is still in good enough shape to give you give us a few more years of, uh, of good service. I did notice this streak here and Chris Randall told me about it that he'd noticed it uh, a long time ago before he removed it from its uh, original place. Cleaned up a little bit more. <clears throat> Put it back in the holder. Cinched up the little mounts. And put it back to uh, uh, put it back to its resting place in the house. All right. All right. My centering dot is still there, but I'm going to demonstrate this anyways. To find the center of your mirror, so you can put one of those notebook rings. Get yourself a nice clean sheet of paper. Put your mirror straight down onto it. Do not rub the mirror. Put it down in one motion. Get yourself a pencil and trace the mirror. Going around, going around, and finish off the circle. And in one swift action, remove the mirror. Don't slide it. Now here, it's all academic. Take a pair of scissors, cut out that circle as close to and on top of that line as you can. Try to find yourself some of those uh, ring binder circles. Uh, don't order them from Amazon, you'll end up with a box of 500. Uh, that was something that's worth going to CVS or Staples or something and getting a very, very small box. Some of your collimation devices have those circles in them. If they do, guard them. <laughs> Put them in a safe place. All right, finished. We're going to fold it. Fold it in half. Now we're going to fold it again into quarters. Then take, the, then take the scissors and nip off the very, very tip. Maybe a pen width worth. Like right there. That's what you're looking for. We line up the edges and we'll find the center. Hold the edge, place the circle, if it's anything bigger than this, you might even consider taping it to the edges. Take the sharpie, and I know my hand gets in the way, just put a small dot right where that piece of paper has that has a little hole in it. And lo and behold, although it's a little hard to see, you've got a small dot right smack in the middle of the mirror. We're going to do at this point is a pair of tweezers and one of those little circles that actually came in the collimation, uh, collimation box. I'm going to peel one off. Gently hold it in the tweezers. And I'm going to use the cover that we just cut out so I can rest my hand on the mirror while it's not on the mirror. And I'm going to line up that circle exactly where I had the little dot from the Sharpie. I'll hold it down with one end of a pencil, put it aside, and the easiest is then take that piece of paper, I can use a finger, and press the circle down. And there you have it. You found the dead center of your mirror for collimation purposes. Looks good. Looks centered. 
Okay, because my hand was in the way, uh, I found these pictures of us doing the uh, uh, reinstallation of the East Dome mirror that's 18 inches across. And uh, they're called hole reinforcements after I, after I looked them up, and you can get them for $4.99 for, I'm sorry, $3.99 for a pack of 200 if you're going to ever need that many. So I've already jumped the gun here. <clears throat> Tracy Ganoss has already cut out the, cir the circle, analogous to what I did. She's nipped the corner. She's going to hold it down and come in with a sharpie and put a singular dot dead center in the mirror. Now where I used tweezers, she used a, uh, a pencil to try to tease it into place. I would prefer the tweezers. That's entirely up to you. Tracy's a very, very experienced individual at doing this. Her preferred method is a pencil. You actually have to figure out what works for you. Uh, if you've got hemostats, may even be better. I would still consider using the uh, paper cutout you just did to give your your hand a resting place as you manipulate manipulate the whole reinforcement hole into the right place. Uh, Kurt Lewis in the background, my left back, uh, positioning it, and there we have it, done and ready to go. Another view. And there you go. Time to put the primary back in. Checking to make sure all the, the adjustment screws are touching the uh, plate where the mirror is, orienting it so that one goes to one, two goes to two. And the only thing I can tell you is this will just take a little bit of time. We've got to get it all on the inside. And your scope, your scope may be different. <clears throat> Realize I need a flashlight to, uh, to uh, uh, make sure I can find the uh, place in the cell where the uh, attachment bolt uh, screws into. Jiggling around forward, backward, into each side. Because it's very easy, and I actually do it here. Uh, I'll actually end up slipping the screw in between the two plates. It's kind of easy to misidentify, but then you'll see the you'll see the threads, and then you're good to go. And you notice when I do hit it, um, I won't tighten it all the way. You want to have a little bit of slack in there until all three are seated and then tighten them all up. And I also show you this full length because I don't want to leave you with the impression in a, a short video that this can be done in a half an hour. Now this whole thing I would plan on uh, plan on making it a good two to two to two and a half hour adventure and then more if you're gonna uh, and uh, it'll take time when you when you're doing the uh, uh, collimation as well. to end. Flip it over. <clears throat> Using the flashlight to double check the location. And this is where I actually ended up between the two plates. Nope, not quite there yet. I'll find it'll only go in part way. Oh nope, pull it out, realign.
Again, the attachment of your primary may be different than this one. See what's in your owner's manual. Tightening them up. We'll talk more about that screw on the secondary in a little bit. Go ahead and tighten it in. Take a peek, and as I'll show you, didn't quite hit it right. So the mirror's a little off. So we're going to come back here. And I'd stitch it up a little bit too tight. It's all right. I'm actually swapping the glove on the other hand. I want to see if I can get a hold of it and move it just a little bit. And I found out I tightened it a little bit too tight. So I'm just going to undo it about an eighth of a turn where there's still enough tension, but where I can rotate the mirror. In. What you should see with the secondary in there, you should be able to see enti the entire primary mirror. And we're good. All right, let's just start the discussion about collimation. Uh, I'm going to use laser collimators here, but the catch is here, the coll laser collimator, the collimator has to be collimated because of how these things are constructed is actually a laser inside of a tube held there by three contact points. And if those contact points are out of alignment, then so is the internal laser. So there are a number of little devices you can make. One here out, here out of wood with two little V-slots and you put your uh, collimator into it and you rotate the collimator very slowly and I'll be demonstrating this. Rotate it slowly and make sure that the spot on the wall is in the same place. If it isn't then you've got to, like doing your secondary mirror, uh, make adjustments in the collimator with an Allen wrench. <clears throat> so you may have to loosen two to adjust one and back and forth and go back and forth with it. I also 3D printed one, and though cute and small and quick to print, uh, it sort of did the job, but it needs a hold down point. Actually, what I need to glue it to do is glue it to a, to a piece of wood. Now, here's one that I, uh, uh, skip the tomato, uh, here's one that I just threw together on a piece of spare flooring and uh, super glued some PVC piping down. Now, what you do, as I said, you put that down. Put your collimator on there, put a spot on the wall, at least a focal, focal length away from the wall, and rotate the, uh, rotate the collimator and check it. All right, I'm going to show you this one. I've got a piece of paper on the wall. I'm going to put this one on, this one's on the mount, and we're going to rotate it. As you adjust, as you move the collimator on the stand, you're going to realize you're just simply touching it is going to make it move. Also, there could be some undulations and little things of the label on there will throw it off. So you have to take it all in one big picture, if you will, as to how if your collimator is out of collimation or not. 
this one is largely staying where I point it, even though there's some motion with just my touching it. But it's not walking around in a circle. So this one's good. This one's good. And we're, we're going to use this one. This is the other collimator. Um, nothing against the Orion, but this is the Orion collimator, and I had to make some adjustments here. But here it is without, without making the adjustments first. And as you can see, it's walking. It's kind of doing a half circle, then the little opening gets hung up a little bit on the, uh, on the stand, and I end up repositioning it. But anytime I moved the uh, collimator or rotated it ever so slightly, the central, uh, the dot there, the red dot moved. And it told me that it was uh, just a touch, touch uh, out. Yeah, going from there to there. So this was in need of adjustment. And what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to use that Allen wrench, find the holes and open those holes, even if that needs busting through the label, so that you can make the make the uh, make the needed adjustments. Or as I said, it is important to make sure the collimator is collimated itself. All right, through the miracle of time uh, and about ten to twelve minutes. Uh, I got the Ryan collimator uh, pretty well squared away. As you can see here, it moves every time I touch it, but for the most part, the red dot stays <clears throat> stays where it needs to be. So I was, I was happy with this result and will gladly use this one uh, as well. Keep one in the field with you so you can do an on-the-spot collimation. Collimation devices are all over the all over the net and, and, and for sale just about everywhere. This one is actually a, an eyepiece like one. Uh, you just put it in and look for the top hole. Uh, some of them come with plastic ones like it. You can also make your own out of an old film canister if you've got enough of those spares. You cut out the bottom and use the lid and cut one and uh, drill a hole direct top dead center. Some will put a black ring on the inside as well. Both can be handy. Okay, we're repositioning the, the, the secondary here. We've got it set up. It took eight full turns to lock the uh, secondary into position. So what I do is I back off one and a half to two and still double check and make sure that the secondary is centered in the eyepiece. Then I put the secondary, uh, secondary adjustment screws up to the plate and I start walking them around until you can see the, where, where the laser goes. You'll sometimes see it hit the reinforcement hole. I'll cinch it up and it'll scoot out of the way. And you've got to work all three of these knobs off of each other, loosening some, tightening other, going back and forth to get it all firmly cinched so that the secondary is locked in place. Secondaries, as a rule, will not move. Uh, most of your adjustment will have to be in the will, will be with the primary mirror out in the field. But once the secondary is in place, it's usually pretty good. This is just an extended still of it being uh, centered. We're good to go. The next spot here is to adjust the primary. Adjusting the primary is where the laser collimator shines because you point it back at you when you're back down at the mirror making the adjustments. And you're basically just turning a given screw, see where it goes, to walk it up, walk it around until you get it in a, get it get it centered. And by that, we're good. Alright, in closing, let's revisit uh, the secondary mirror. So we've got a few few uh, comments to make. Here's a secondary out of uh, my particular telescope, as we know, and you may find your secondary having slightly different uh, different parts. This one is a uh, this one is a single arm. Uh, you might have a three vein or even a four vein. Uh, I've seen a two vein where the uh, secondary is attached to a piece of metal and is largely in a very fixed position. 
So the only way to, to, to clean that secondary is to take out the assembly or use a mirror and uh, reach in from the inside. Um, I've also come, come across secondaries that when you take off the, the mount and you're left with a housing here and the mirror assembly, uh, there's a, a Teflon ring and possibly even a spring between them. Uh, this Celestron Starhopper did not have that. Um, so the procedure I ended up working for to make this all to, to work was uh, I would back the secondary alignment screws, that would be these three Teflon screws, until they're, abs until they're flush with this housing. Then with a solid hold on it, I'll install the secondary mirror, mirror and do this horizontally if at all possible. Count the number of turns it takes with this screw to seat the mirror. Turn, then turn the secondary alignment screws inward until they just make contact with the secondary mirror assembly. Don't force them. Loosen the hold down screw for the secondary maybe one and a half to two full turns. You gotta have some slack in there in order to make the adjustment with these three knobs. When I put it in I got full eight full turns out of it. So backing it off two turns is okay. Turn the alignment screws until you make contact with the secondary. Then you gently adjust, uh, adjust them until the laser or crosshairs, whatever means you're using to do the collimation, are centered. You may have to loosen, say for example, two that are opposite so that you can make an adjustment in this one. And that's basically how the collimation process works. They're all going to be snug with each other. So if I want to adjust this one, tighten this one because the, the, I, need the, I need the dot to move a particular direction, then I might need to loosen these in order to make the adjustment for this one. And you end up playing these three off of each other in that way. And then when you're finally done, give it a little nudge here. Give these guys a very ever so slight nudge keeping it all centered and you should be good. In nearly a hundred percent of the time than taking the scope on outreach events, I have never had to worry about secondary collimation when I get to an event. It is almost invariably uh, having to rework the primary. The primary because of its size and weight and jarring on the road will uh, come out of collimation. So I almost always, always have to adjust the, uh, adjust the primary. Now I bring this one up because it have a very interesting story and a uh, uh, plug for Bob's knobs. You might ask, well now wait a minute, these are thumb screws. You don't have a screwdriver here. Don't want to use a screwdriver if you can at all help it. I would encourage you to swap them out with, with uh, knobs from, uh, from Bob, Bob's knobs company. The reason is you don't want to deal with a screwdriver because you don't want that screwdriver accidentally slipping out of your hand and going all the way down to your primary. That would be a bad day. So one here is missing because I bought uh, Bob's knobs here that are supposed to be for the Celestron uh, telescope. And to make a very long story short, I've had them for like three years and I just never got around to putting them in. But I thought, hey, this would be a good time to do it. And I found they didn't fit. So I reached out to Bob's Knobs and said, hey, I've got this little problem. No, I'm not asking for a refund, but I would appreciate uh, knowing what is the correct um, thumb screw to use. And I will gladly, uh, gladly put in that order. And they came back with a, a response that kind of surprised me. They said, please take a picture of the knob, the product that we sent you, that we both know is supposed to fit the Celestron scope, with a, a, a ruler and the knob that came out of your secondary. So, oh, okay. So I went one better. I measured both the nylon screw and the screw that's supposed to be its replacement. And you can obviously see a very interesting flip here, 3.38 and then 3.83. There's a modest difference, which explains why this one didn't fit. I sent them that and I sent them this picture and I got a very interesting response coming back. 
they said, we have never, never seen this secondary assembly in a Celestron product. And you're correct, those screws do not fit. And they said that the appropriate screw apparently fit the Mead, uh, the smaller Mead SCTs, and they're on their way. I said, are you sure you don't want me to, you know, throw, throw $20 at you through the PayPal? I said, no, no, we'll be happy to, to, to provide them. So that was, that was very welcome and very, very cool of them. But you might ask, why would I want to replace these? These are thumb screws. They're already there. I don't need the screwdriver. They're nylon. They're 20 years old. They're oxidizing. And I have a very slight fear of snapping one of these off or having it just simply break off because of age. I would rather have metal in there. Um, so I was going to opt to, to swap them out. If something happened and I were to lose the head and the piece is still in there, my only alternative is I have to come back with a matched thread from this side and try to screw it toward us in the plane of the screen and try to push that part of the screw out. Um, a broken secondary screw in a secondary mirror is a bad day because you can't collimate the scope. So that's my part of my reason. I would rather use these, um, keep them around and use them for spare uh, tail, rad, tail rad screws. All right. In conclusion, the goal here was to show that uh, cleaning the mirror and corrector plates isn't complex and in fact is very straightforward to do. Just take your time in doing it and be cautious about your mirror and careful in what you do. Don't fear cleaning. Yes, um, I'm probably adding a sixth YouTube video to this, but you'll get five different YouTube videos that will tell you five different things. Um, I know people that clean their mirrors barehanded. I've seen a YouTube vid from a uh, telescope mirror manufacturing company where the guy put literally put a thumbprint on a brand new mirror and simply cleaned it off with acetone and chem wipes. Cleaning in the sink as we've done with, a, with or without the Dawn detergent, just water and some ethyl and some isopropanol is a great way to keep your mirror going. Learn to collimate routinely, even out in the field when needed or at an outreach event. The final check is always a star. That laser up or, or ocular, up, ocular piece or a Cheshire, for example, is not going to be the final thing. I borrowed this from Gary Serenix. Um, this is actually off of a reflector. Uh, you might have to deal with the central obstruction and what, but here's a case where, no, secondary isn't quite right. Here's where, here's where you're dialed in right. So the final check will always be with a star, no matter what. And with that, I hope this was of use, and I thank you for your time.